Hello, hello. So today we're here to talk about e-commerce with RGA and RMIT. So welcome to this series of events where I chat to industry experts to, who explain current and relevant disciplines of business and marketing. So today we'll talk about e-commerce, which is one of the biggest experts in Australia. So I gave you the title of biggest expert, Michael. Are you going there? Yeah, you are. <laughs> and you are big. Yeah, sure. I know that. So Michael is currently a VP, which means Vice President and Managing Director at RGA. And Michael, it's easy, one of the few in Australia who can bring diverse expertise across brand, creative and tech. That's which is really, really important. So today, Michael will help us to understand what is e-com, uh, how is the process of a company or brand deciding to start e-com, skills and technology, what, what, what we should know as basics, right? And this very interesting concept of um, adaptive e-commerce created by RGA. So today the webinar will be about one hour. That includes time for questions. So please send the questions to me and I'll moderate these questions for Michael. Also, this question, this session is recorded and it will be available for you to rewatch. Uh, but I'll ask you please to not share outside, but you can rewatch this as many times as you want. So I'm your host, I'm Lucio Ribeiro, and I'm a lecturer of artificial intelligence at RMIT Future Skills, and also lecturer of digital marketing at RMIT. Uh, I'm also a marketing consultant and founder of Lucio AI, which is a business that helps CMOs with their digital needs. So um, that's enough about me, that's enough about the introduction of this session. So welcome, Mike. It's a pleasure having you here with me. So before we kick off, would you give just a little bit of your background and what you're currently up to? Yeah, sure. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, Background-wise, I've, I've worked in uh, digital agencies, um, including some of the sort of largest um, digital and tech um, shops in the world. So over at Digitas in London, um, I led accounts like Avis and Budget and the digital transformation um, across Europe, Middle East and Africa uh, and re-platformed uh, the sort of the Avis and, and Budget um, sites across 22 different markets there as well. Um, prior to joining RGA, when I came back to Australia, I was Managing Director of CHE Proximity. Uh, we were awarded fourth most innovative um, company in Australia at that time, one six times agency of the year. Um, and importantly, I think for our tech team um, and digital experience team, from about 20 people to about 150. Um, so the Melbourne office I ran was about 250 when I left. Um, and I joined RGA about a year and a half ago. Um, so um, joined RGA, I think, because there's this really interesting model of consultancy and creative businesses coming together. Um, and I think e-commerce is a great example of where those uh, capabilities combine to deliver value back to brands. And um, Michael, for those who don't understand, and, and my, my audience might not understand exactly what RGA, uh, how, how big it is the agency and how uh, meaningful work they do, just give you a little wrap up of RGA. Yeah, sure. RGA, we've got 18 offices around the world. There's about 1,600 um, employees. Um, so I look after the offices uh, across Melbourne uh, and Sydney. There's about 70 of us here. Um, we're an innovation and creative consultancy. Our most famous work is what we do with Nike. So we've been working with them for 17 years. Um, we help them to invent um, Nike ID, Nike Plus. Uh, we created the Nike Fuel Band um, and are constantly working with them to um, update their digital ecosystem to connect with their customers in new and interesting ways and have been a partner with them in terms of transforming themselves from I mean, a power company in the sporting industry to, to a really a tech and data company and that ecosystem of, of different Nike touch points. Um, you know, I've seen quotes from their global CMO that, that people are engaged in that Nike Plus ecosystem that are two times as valuable to them uh, than other Nike customers. So it, it proves the value of of things like e-commerce uh, for brands like that. Perfect. So, Michael, what I'm going to do is I'm going to silence myself, I'm going to mute myself, and I'm going to give you the stage back to you. You have a presentation you want to share with us. Um, so it's your show now, mate. Thank you. Cool. Thanks for that. Before I um, jump into the presentation, um, I know you did ask me just to give you a lay down in terms of you know what e-commerce is. and. I might just give a, a quick update on how I see the current state of e-commerce because the presentation I'll share is really about where we see e-commerce going tomorrow. 
Um, and so just to lay, lay the foundations, you know, e-commerce, you know, officially it's the buying and selling of goods and services over the internet. Um, and traditionally that has been over websites. Um, but it's becoming a bit more complicated. You know, it's now through apps, social platforms like Messenger and Snap. Um, you can even do e-commerce within an email and not having to, to go outside of those walls as well. Um, when you think of the more traditional e-commerce and the big platforms, I think there's probably three key platforms. Shopify is really the leader when it comes to e-commerce from an e-commerce platform perspective. Um, and then you'll find lots of big organisations if they're on um, um, technology stacks like Adobe that they're likely to work with Magento in the e-commerce space from a technology platform perspective and, and Cycle is the other big one that has commerce integrated into it. More often than not, you'll see most organisations will build really custom systems uh, to deliver e-commerce because their businesses are so unique um, and their products are unique as well. But if there's sort of three big platforms to be aware of, I, I think they're, they're it. Um, I think that definition of e-commerce is rapidly evolving though because um, it's, it's quite, most businesses don't just sell online, they also um, sell offline and, and the journey of a, of a customer purchasing with a brand doesn't just happen on one device or one touch point. And so you'll hear a lot of about omni-channel commerce and that's where you're combining both physical and digital touch points um, in that purchase journey and that's really where e-commerce is evolving to, being able to connect all those different touch points together to provide the best experience for customers in order to sell as much product for brands as possible. Uh, so hopefully that just sort of lays the foundation in terms of where e-commerce sort of currently is. Um, obviously we've all been experienced with the COVID pandemic over the last um, you know, six months or so. Um, and I think you know, it's a lot of industry research has shown that it's accelerated our digital behaviours by about five years. Um, and I'm seeing that both in research coming through, but also clients that we work with as well in terms of pulling things forward that they were looking at um, doing in a number of years' time. I think, you know, in terms of when and how clients, the brands decide to go into e-commerce, um, it's kind of um, a necessity these days. It's not whether to do it or not to do it. It's just how to do it in the right way for them. Um, and so for us, with this sort of complex environment coming up uh, and having done a lot of um, e-commerce experiences for brands around the globe, uh, we've come up with this proposition we call adaptive e-commerce, which is where we see e-commerce moving to in the future. So I might just um, share the presentation and go through that with you. Perfect, thank you. Cool. So this yell if you um if you can't see the screen. Uh, and so for us, right. Um, and so for us, um, e-commerce. E-commerce is such a wide statement, um, and so we think it's really important for um, clients to understand where they should invest their money uh, and where they shouldn't bother. Um, and where they should focus their, their resources. And that's what we call um, adaptive e-commerce. So throughout this presentation, um, I'll just give you a bit of a setup in terms of how we see the new, what the new reality of e-commerce is, um, how we can help define the right opportunities and then go into market um, where it counts. So I think what's really interesting is that brands have always known that the in-store experience has always been key to winning customers over. Um, it hasn't just been about the product itself, but the experience that you get in that store. You go into a JB Hi-Fi and you see the relatively young staff with the lanyards on and all the cheap prices um, around the place, and you know you're getting cheap prices with, with great advice. You know, you, you go to a Gucci store and they, they make people line up outside, even though there's more space inside, and the fit out in, inside is, is really luxurious. And it, that sort of exclusive experience is part of the brand experience, just as much as the, the clothes um, are themselves. Now 7-Eleven, when you go into most 7-Elevens um, within Australia, most of the shelves are only at um, shoulder height. So as soon as you go in, you can see the product you want to get in and out really convenient. And obviously that 
folds into their sort of distribution strategy as well. They're often on corners, um, easy to access. Um, and then not, um, brands like Nike, you know, really progressive um, in their products, in what they stand for as brand, as a brand, but also in their, their demonstrations and the way you can experience those products um, in store as well. Um, and, and what I think is really interesting about all of those things is that whilst people have known the, the physical shopping experience is a, is a really important part of the brand and, and a value exchange with customers, that hasn't necessarily been so um, when it comes to e-commerce. I think in a lot of different categories, you can go to competitors within e-commerce and the experience is actually very, very similar. If you change the colours and swapped out the logo, you'd, it'd be really hard to determine which brand um, you were with. Um, whereas if you work into a Nike store versus a Gucci store and you remove the labels, you'd have a much better idea of understanding um, who they are. And I think this, the way that we are purchasing um, is changing at a really, really rapid rate. Right, especially with that COVID acceleration that I mentioned. Um, what's really interesting is that it's, like I was saying, it's really hard for brands to, to differentiate. There's also a number of components outside of brands' control when it comes to the online shopping experience. Um, because that experience doesn't just happen when they hit your website, your app, um, or, or whatever that might be. It starts from things like the Google search. Brands can't change the experience that people have within Google Shopping because that's on the Google platform. Um, a lot of, you know, there's now Instagram Shopping um, in the States where you can actually fulfill an order within the Instagram um, platform without having to click through um, to a brand site like you do in Australia currently, which makes the experience um, a lot better to fully convert in the platform. You know, a lot of brands are selling within marketplaces like eBay and Amazon, and once again, there's limited control that you have over those. So there's this changing dynamic of once being able to control the physical environment um, to having to work within um, a more complex um, journey that you don't necessarily control every touch point in. Um, the other thing to note here is that you know, payment provider pro providers now part of the experience. So Afterpay is a massive consideration for consumers. So is PayPal on whether they convert on your site or not and something else to consider. Um, and the other point is that on, on and offline can't be thought of as different things. Um, you know, people can reserve products online, pick them up in store. Um, within stores, you have endless aisles, uh, like this example from Walmart. Uh, where if you can't see the physical product, you can um, you can find it um, online. I mean, obviously, click and collect has seen massive growth up for the last, for the last few years as well. And what we're kind of seeing is that brands that don't just focus on the, on the product but the purchase journey um, seem to be really, really thriving. So the iconic, um, which is an amazing success story, really owns the fastest delivery um, and and um, easy returns. I think a lot of people go to that platform, um, not because they can find a unique product, but because that service um, is so great. Koala is really interesting in terms from a mattress perspective. I think changes to their product and the ability to roll those mattresses up uh, mean that the commerce experience can be quite different because transportation um, of the product has become a lot easier. You don't need to go hire that, that ute or that, um, that van to go to a click and collect, for example. Um, and then other services are really adding value uh, beyond just what they do. And Uber Eats is a great example of that. Um, you don't just go on that platform to order food. It actually helps you decide what to eat for dinner. So, uh, these different uh, brands are focusing on, on different areas to provide value that no one else was um, in that area previously. I mean, they're all um, seen a lot of success from it. Um, I expect a lot of brands are um, investing in e-commerce and it is a massive investment. It's not just a website or a platform. Uh, you've got to think about the, the product distribution, the fulfillment of that, 
what happens if it doesn't fit and people need to return it, um, how do you deal with that stock, all those kinds of things. So it's a massive investment uh, for different companies. Um, and that's just getting um, more and more so. So clients, uh, people are expecting things to be on sale or, or on promotion. Um, they expect a really um, seamless CX across every single channel, so customer experience. Um, they want the opportunity to buy now and pay later. Um, you know, they, how do you interact within marketplaces? Um, and then in some more progressive things, things like um, augmented reality are key to a number of really interesting things where you can actually um, use your phone and augmented reality to place pieces of furniture in your house before you purchase them. Um, but not everyone's an IKEA, no, not everyone has the ability to invest in, in those progressive things. And so often brands will see all, these, see all these things that they need to succeed in e-commerce and just get really overwhelmed and not know where to start. And I think what's really important for brands is knowing where you shouldn't compete, uh, where you don't really have the best opportunity to succeed, so it helps you define what you do. Um, and that's what this sort of adaptive e-commerce proposition is all about. It's about being really focused um, and sort of taking advantage of opportunity um, that hasn't been um, tapped before. Uh, and that opportunity could come out of new technology, new customer behaviour, um, or, or sort of unique assets you've got as a brand or business. And so we talk about it as um, the creation of, of relevant purchase moments. And just to break that down, um, so it's creating a new um, kind of purchase and, and that's really important not to just have the same kind of purchase experiences as all of your competitors actually finding a point of difference. Uh, relevant I think just because another brand does something doesn't mean you should. Um, I think finding something that really is unique to um, your brand. You might have a unique product, you might have a distribution and um, being able to leverage that so people can't copy what you do gives you a real point of differentiation to um, make sure uh, customers are loyal to you and enjoy that purchase experience. Um, and really focusing on customers' technology behaviours of today. So constantly new platforms are coming out, the way we purchase change. I'm sure all of you have all purchased more uh, online during COVID than you had any other time. And, and these kinds of changes in society are going to be sustained somewhat um, as we come out of it. So um, how do we sort of go about defining um, what the right opportunity is for your brand and, and the ambition? Um, we've got a, a, this process. So first it's about um, inputs. So gaining real clarity uh, and focus on what customers want and, and desire um, from the purchase experience. Um, it, for us it's really important not just to look, okay, what is met in category? Know, both from a functional and emotional kind of enjoyment perspective, but also what's not met within the category. And often you can get great inspiration from um, outside of your category to, um, to find something new to differentiate. Um, this is probably the, the most key thing is what are your unique assets and advantages of your business that you can use to create that sort of unique e-commerce experience. And that could be a number of different things. It doesn't have to be all of these things. Um, you know, it could be, you know, brand. Um, you know, Nike has a lot of exclusive um, sneaker launches, for example, and people seek those out. So you can leverage that interest in a really different way. Um, I think, you know, it could be that you have a distribution network that's quite different to others so you can deliver it faster. So it is speed one that you're going to compete on. So understanding where you sit versus your competitors and the value that can provide customers gives a really good platform to start to focus down where you should um, look at free commerce. Um, I think with any anything in the, the digital and innovation space, you know, you're going to have hypotheses and, and create ideas. Um, and it's really important to make sure you, you test those out um, with prototypes, with customers, make sure that the business can fulfill the experience that, that you're looking to create. 
Um, we go through this sort of flare and focus methodology that allows you to, to test as you move along to make sure you get into a solution that delivers the best value both for the brand and for the customer. Um, and then finally, um, I think it's just making sure that the investment required to deliver it is going to deliver um, you sort of the return that you need. Uh, and so there's three key areas that we look at there. Um, so market opportunity, you know, does it create a new opportunity for the business um, and therefore opening up more revenue opportunity? Um, does the solution deliver commercial benefit? So understanding how much you need to invest, both in terms of uh, people, resources, technology sort of costs, um, licensing, um, fulfillment, all those kind of things, making sure you understand the cost of those and, and sort of the benefit that you're expecting. Um, and those two things can work and define what the solution will be. Um, and it's really important to consider all three components of this as you're developing that solution um, rather than thinking of them in isolation. Uh, and we often go through um, these sort of four steps um, in defining um, what we think the best uh, e-commerce solution is for clients. So um, first one is discovering the right opportunities. So as I spoke about, you know, what are, are people's met and unmet needs and desires both in and out of the category? So you're starting to get an understanding for, for what people would be interested in and um, what's, what's coming a clear space for you competing. The second point under that is uh, where does the business uh, have unique assets or advantage that can be leveraged? You know, obviously operations, product or brand. I think what's really important here is the unique assets. The less that someone can, a competitor can copy you um, sort of tomorrow on it, um, the more of a sustained advantage it's going to be. Um, and then sort of at the start of this process, we haven't really tested anything. We don't know much, but it's a low investment. So the risk is currently high, but the investment is quite low. We then move into sort of crafting the right solutions. What's our hypothesis based on those input in terms of how we should develop an e-commerce experience? Um, how um, can we sort of differentiate to unlock growth? So having a point of difference like the Iconic enabled it to you know, create sales that almost out, that outpaced Meyer online within the first five years because it had a real point of difference, even though it didn't have all the infrastructure and, and relationships um, that Meyer did. Um, and then really devalue, develop what that value proposition and concept is. I think once we sort of get to the end of that second stage, that's all around sort of understanding what the desire is in the market for the right kind of solution. We then move more into the feasibility stage. So developing a minimum viable product um, from the concept and starting to validate that as well. So um, can we bring the value proposition to life? How could we bring that to, to life? Um, you know, and that's making sure that we're starting to do a lot of testing there. So we rather than build sort of the whole e-commerce proposition, you can do a prototype a lot quicker, a lot more cost effective, but you can um, garner inset, insights from that by testing it both within the business from a process point of view, but also with customers. Um, and that allows you to refine that and optimise that before you then go into viability and scale. That's where you're um, investing a lot more money into it um, and pushing it out to a lot more, more people. So, and that's where, where, where the business case um, gets finalised. Um, and then I think the, the value proposition there is, does it make commercial sense, making sure that we're going to get a return on investment? Um, and I think the, the key output there is making sure you've got that business case to, to launch this experience uh, platform, whatever it may be, to life. And you can see throughout that process, as you go through, um, the risk becomes lower, but the investment becomes um, higher. So Michael, sorry, just just let me just make sure this is wrap up to the, to the audience. Pretty much, if you go back one slide, if you don't mind. So pretty much all of these all these uh, these gates, these gateways you have from one face to another is pretty much responding three big questions. Do my customers, or my prospects, want this, which is the the desirability? 
Can actually we do this, which is being visible? And should we do this, which is probably, would be fair to, to say it's about, do they want? Can we do? Should we do? Yeah, absolutely. That's a very simple way to sum it up. Nice one. Cool. So um, what I want to do is just share a couple of, of examples of adaptive e-commerce that we've done just to help bring it to life as to what these solutions could um, end up being. And I think for us, it's it's less about just doing a website like everyone else is doing, but, but finding that unique opportunity. So there's, there's three examples here. Um, one was um, the launch of the Air Jordan 3 Tinkers. Um, and what we did there was um, used a, a Snap filter, so the Snap social platform. Um, we understood that this uh, there would be sort of high demand for, for this product release. Uh, and what we allowed people to do around the States was to find basketball courts where you'd hold up your, your phone and your Snap filter um, to see an augmented reality um, picture um, of Jordan doing his classic dunk. I think it was the 10, it was the anniversary of um, when he did his, his famous dunk. Um, you had to find um, that augmented picture to be able to view the product and purchase it within the app. And then we partnered with Dark Store, which is a fulfillment uh, company who would get that product delivered to you within two hours. Uh, and so what we got there was Yes, the shoe sold out in 23 minutes, which is great. Um, but it was also being able to get value beyond just selling the product. So we got amazing press coverage. It also got 5.8 million people um, opening the Snap filter, engaging with the brand, looking for it. Um, and so I think that's just an example of um, an innovative product launch um, that garners a lot of hype around. Um, to get value beyond just a, a sale. Um, this is one that we worked on uh, locally here in Australia out of our Melbourne office, uh, which was the launch of the all new Supra for Toyota last year. Um, I think what's really interesting about the automotive industry is that e-commerce hasn't really been um, a big thing to date. But looking at the behaviours outside of the category, we knew there must be some possibility within it. The Super is a well sought after vehicle. Um, and so what we were able to do, only having 150 cars um, for the first release, um, was take learnings from the likes of um, Gucci and how they treat um, exclusive products. And so what we did was it was an online only um, shopping um, showroom. Um, so you know, in the auto industry, usually you um, you say that people have to come into a dealership, see the car and test drive the car before before they'll buy it. No one ever got to see the car or test drive it. It was an online only showroom. Um, it was an experience that really felt like you'd get up close, personal to the car. Um, to build hype for it and knowing there was only 150 cars, there was a bit of a campaign to garner interest. And you had to register to get into the showroom. But just like those exclusive Gucci stores would only let a certain number of people into the showroom. Uh, they were given 10 minutes to um, to reserve their car. Otherwise, they'd get kicked out and sort of the next person would be allowed into the showroom. Um, and what we were able to do there was get 150 cars sold in, in 22 minutes. And these aren't cheap cars. Like some of them are almost $100,000. Um, and so I think it was a really interesting um, use case to, to see how customer behaviours are changing from a physical to a digital um, environment. Uh, and the third one um, that I'll touch on here is from um, Sonic Burgers. Um, so Sonic Burgers out of the States um, has a unique driving model uh, where there's about rather than sort of have one drive drive through like a McDonald's have, it has, you know, 10, 20 um, stations that cars can pull up into. And in the old days, um, you press the red button and, and order your burger and they'd bring it out to, to your car. Um, I think their proposition was always that they were the, you know, um, burgers um, at sonic speed. They're always the fastest burgers. But um, 
with the likes of their competitors doing, you know, order ahead um, kind of omni-channel experiences. Um, they needed a new way to, to win back that proposition. And so for them, uh, we created this app that allowed you to order ahead, but rather than a, a McDonald's where after you'd order ahead, you'd get there and you have to wait in line to pick it up, whether it's through the drive-through or, or in the store. We have the new, unique um, advantage of having multiple driving um, stores. And so with this app, you could order ahead and then using geographic location technology, we can make sure that the order is cooked at the right time, depending on how far away you are from the stall. So you'd literally pull in and you'd get, um, you'd be pull in and be able to pull out in under two minutes, um, which was much faster than, than any other competitors. And so from that, we'll see um, you know, sales results increase threefold um, and we'll able to start to personalise um, value for people within that app um, to create a lot more loyalty for them as well. So there are three very different e-commerce experiences um, that hopefully bring to life sort of the adaptive component um, of e-commerce that we're talking about here. Um, the, those three very unique um, e-commerce experiences were right for those brands and those products. I think the, the Jordan shoes, um, that augmented reality um, experience was right for them because it was a sought after brand and product. For the Supra, um, you know, the online showroom, having to register your interest there and you get sort of only 10 minutes to reserve your car, worked well when there was a, a limited number of products and we knew, knew there was high interest. Um, and for, for Sonic, for example, um, it was a unique solution for them because no one had that advantage of, of the multiple stores to drive into. So no one could copy that. And so um, all of those examples are, are, are ones that have found opportunity that can't be are copied by the people and was right for the customer and the brand. Um, the next thing I want to touch on was um, building e-commerce solutions just to be adaptable um, into the future. I think, you know, with um, behaviours being accelerated by technology at such a rapid rate, um, businesses are really wary of investing a lot in e-commerce now. Um, and it not being relevant in the future when new technology comes along and new customer behaviours happen. And so when it comes to technology, we've got a, a modular approach we call um, the, the Lean Stack approach. Um, I won't get too technical for, for the people um, on this call, but I think what I would like to touch on here is historically enterprise systems um, have been connected. So you've got this interface or where the customer kind of interacts with you. Um, and then you've got different um, technologies that sit underneath that to deliver that experience. So it could be sort of logins from an authentication perspective. Um, and would then need to connect into your warehouses or where your stock is, for example. Um, and then obviously hosted um, from an environmental perspective. Previously in an enterprise um, stack, all those things were connected. So if you wanted to change just the customer interface, um, you'd have to change everything that sits behind it. Um, whereas now with more um, microservices or modular approach, um, you can start to be, have building blocks that allow you to focus on one component and then adapt to other components as you move forward. So this is just a, a random example that if you wanted to um, just look at selling our website um, through one of your warehouses. Um, you could do so in this environment and then add other services on um, at a later date as they become a re more relevant for you. Um, I think an interesting thing there is social, for example. We know that you know, social commerce is constantly evolving, like the Instagram example I shared um, at the start of this discussion. Um, so this more modular approach um, to e-commerce ensures that brands can invest now and get return on investment quickly, but also make it adaptable and flexible for the future. I think the other benefit of that modular approach is that it allows you to get to market quickly with something. So you don't need to build everything across every touch point to start to um, sell product 
um, online and through digital um, to get a return. And I think what that does is it proves value um, back to the business that garners more investment and allows you to continue. Um, whereas traditionally, there's been this sort of big bang approach where it often takes up to two, three years to build that e-commerce solution and you'd launch it and hope that what you designed you know, two years ago is still relevant today. Um, we've got um, that more modular approach allows you to rather than just use one big piece of technology, use lots of little bits of technology that can be more uh, relevant for you. Um, at RGA, we've got a, a ventures program. So we've got um, equity in about 120 um, late stage um, startup and emerging technology companies that allows you to go really deep on some interesting technologies. So the Nike Air Jordan example I spoke around, um, we partnered with Darkstore, um, which is one of these companies that really helps companies, um, you know, fulfill, do fulfillment really quickly um, by um, doing distributed um, warehouses across cities. Um, I won't go through all of these different um, technologies uh, now, but I think uh, the thing to take out of this is there is so much innovation happening at so many different areas of e-commerce. Um, there's not one solution that can be best in class at everything. And so that process I talked about around understanding what your proposition is and where you want to, to win, that can then help you define which bits of technology, whether that's um, digitizing in store, whether that's logistics, whether that's um, rewards, understanding which ones are right for the value proposition you're giving your customers. Um, I think the other point um, on that is there is virtually no companies out there that don't have um, some kind of e-commerce already happening. Um, or if they don't, they definitely already have some kind of technology stack. Um, and whilst we use a lot of uh, modern services um, that are quite modular and narrow um, in, in their functionality, um, they can adapt, they can sort of plug into um, existing um, technology stacks because um, of that modular format I spoke about. That's probably enough. Um, tech talk given the audience, um, but hopefully that makes some sense. I think one thing that is um, really important with e-commerce, um, much more so than um, I suppose other types of marketing and even physical um, stores, is that understanding um, the end-to-end -end needs is really important. So understanding distribution fulfillment um, will really impact the customer experience and you can't design an e-commerce experience without considering all those back office operational requirements because um, they're so key to, to what you provide. Um, so I just thought I'd provide sort of four or so uh, key points that given where we see um, e-commerce going, what we think the, the key things would be for you to consider when entering the market. Um, so to the point I just discussed, I think stakeholder engagement um, is absolutely key. Um, E-commerce tends to require horizontal connections across an organisational and organisations um, departments more so than than most activities because it does require merchandising, it does require stock fulfilment, logistics. It requires marketing to get people there. It requires the customer experience. Um, it requires payments and finance and all those kinds of things. So um, being able to make sure that you can engage with people from different disciplines um, is really key to um, delivering a successful e-commerce uh, platform. Um, the other thing I would um, suggest you consider is defining what your, your T-shape is. So like I was saying, the T is your broad knowledge of e-commerce in terms of all the different um, components that may go into it. But then what's the thing you're going to go deep on? Um, and that could, it could be a number of things. So it could be um, customer experience um, from a CX perspective. So being able to understand where are our customers coming from, how they get into our e-commerce experience and fulfilling that and designing that. Um, it could be more analytical in terms of um, conversion rate optimization or CRO. 
Um, it's amazing the little changes that you can put on an e-commerce site and the impact they have. Um, you know, some businesses are so large that if you can, we've tested the colours of buttons before and it's increased conversion by, you know, 0.5%, but that's resulted in millions um, of conversions over the year. Um, no, or is it social? There's a, a lot of um, innovation happening in the social commerce space. Um, you know, I've, we've seen brands that only sell on Facebook Messenger, for example, doing really well. Um, so I think when organisations are looking to hire, especially younger people entering the market, they're going to be looking for the, these new areas um, because there's less people in the market um, who already have experience in those. So understand e-commerce at a high level holistically, but pick what thing to go, go deep in and position yourself uh, for. Um, be commercially orientated. I think being able to rationalise recommendations um, and decisions for commercial return is, is, is really key. Um, and the watch out here is don't just think about short term sales. I think you want to create an experience that gets customers coming back and back um, and wanting to seek out your e-commerce experience. Um, that will mean less marketing investment is required to, to, for you to constantly deliver the same amount um, of sales. Um, and probably the biggest thing is, is always be curious. Um, what's relevant today isn't going to be relevant in five years' time. Um, so you know, constantly reading, staying on top of, of, of new technology, of new behaviours, um, will make sure you're, you're constantly relevant and, and growing. kind of it for today. Any questions you want me to answer? Oh, Michael, thank you. That's been like, that's been a masterclass. It's been so good. I, I, I even, I, I learned a lot. So um, thank you very much. I have heaps of questions. The questions are coming, uh, for some reason, the questions are, they, they don't. So probably, probably, so I'm gonna throw in the hot seat here. Yeah. And I'll, I have about 10 questions. So I'm just going to give you a few seconds so you can um, drink some water, just get up with your own thoughts. This be phenomenal, Michael. I cannot, I cannot say how great, I cannot even stop thanking you how great this be. Um, I do have a few questions. Still going to be a little bit of, of stuff, and I do have about 10 of them, okay? So I'm not going to sure if you're going to have another time to respond. Keep your heads up. So we have another, another 15 minutes of webinar. And I want you, before we end the webinar, in about 15 minutes, I want, to, I want you to ask the audience. You have one ask to the audience. What would like them to do? Would like them to reach out to your LinkedIn? Would like them to go and tell their friends about RGA? So I just wanted to start thinking this before the end of the session today. One ask to the audience, because you've been so uh, uh, helpful. So uh, first question is, it's a pretty solid question from one of my students here. What is cloud? Like how would it define what cloud means for uh, the students? Uh, in terms of cloud and hosting on the cloud. Um, so rather than have a, a physical server um, that's often located um, on um, sort of a, a business's premises, um, cloud, the cloud enables things to be hosted in, in multiple locations. Um, and so it can be accessed um, quickly and efficiently um, sort of through the internet rather than a physical location. And that's great for, um, uh, for a number of reasons, for, for speed, uh, for security, because there's backups and they're often hosted like companies like Amazon. Um, so I'll just think about it as um, everything from a technology point of view is stored um, up there and always accessible rather than down here and, um, you know, with high risk into, into one um, sort of physical environment. Yeah, it's somewhere in the cloud. <laughs> and this is I asking, uh, Michael, should they, I mean, just for the sake of this, this session, just so the students understand, we have the big tech companies like Amazon, they own AWS, which is Amazon Web Server, which is the cloud, and Microsoft and Google. And each one of them have some of sort of service. Uh, quick question so we can move on to other ones is, should these students, should anyone come to the market, should have some um, 
some understanding of the cloud in terms of at least some basic literacy on, on cloud. Would you advise them? Yeah, I have some literacy on it. I think there, I wouldn't necessarily go too deep on the hosting side of things unless your desire is to go into a more technology led role. Um, I think a lot of the, the hosting cloud, for example, AWS is, is a great example. You've got to know the different providers to talk about. I think you go to them with, hey, these are our needs, and they can come back with, with different solutions for you to assess. I don't think you need to be an expert on the cloud um, to be able to deliver good e-commerce solutions. So yeah, understand what it means in theory. I think there's the background to it has been Businesses historically used to think it was a lot safer and secure to have all their systems and data stored physically um, on a location. Um, you know, I think if, if you have a more modern outlook on this, the likes of Amazon are going to have much more sophisticated um, security software um, than one single organisation is. And so actually the security protocols are quite good in, in the cloud. Um, so it'd be worthwhile being um, aware of different um, barriers I think some people have to accepting it because often in an organisation you need to address that question. Um, but it, I think you know, understanding it makes all your systems accessible from multiple locations, um, which allows for greater efficiency. Awesome. So, uh, Michael, for the, uh, for the marketing directors and CMOs who might be watching this in a catch-up later, it's a question of myself, it's not on the students, but um, in terms of uh, development and maintenance of e-commerce, what is the advantage of using um, um, a proven service, an external provider, proven service like RGA, rather than trying to build this um, family ground up? Yeah, well, I, it depends. I don't necessarily think you should always use someone like RGA, depending on what the need is. So. I find a lot of companies um, build custom um, e-commerce platforms um, because of their unique needs, so website, for example. Um, I would actually encourage um, brands and companies to run those kind of platforms um, internally um, to um, understand the customer data on that and, and optimise it internally because uh, that that is so sort of core to their business. I think where it's useful to engage um, external parties like RGA, who has experience across multiple industries um, and um, can bring learnings from different industries and different brands, and also has a, a, an expertise in understanding technology and people's behaviours to help define the solution and create the solution, but not necessarily run it um, ongoing. Um, that is my generic uh, recommendation. Cool. Um, I have another question. On my, it's not really directly, directly comms, but I think it's quite relevant uh, considering the technology perspective and your experience and exposure to technology. So someone is asking me in store experience using extended realities like uh, augmented reality and VR and things like that. So. Um, who are the best in class, and um, what? How do you see this uh, as a, as a way to um, expose and increase the experience? So my connection was a bit bad, but if you're asking about sort of um, digital experiences within physical stores and, and who's who's doing that really well, yeah, that's it. Um, I can't think of ones, like the one that really comes to mind um, from using that technology is the IKEA one that I spoke about previously, which is more in your home in terms of like picturing a couch in your living room before you go and buy it and drag it all the way back. That feels really, really valuable um, to me. And so I think they're doing a great job um, in that space. Um, yeah, I think there's been some some interesting um, experiments with cars and, you know, just sort of sitting in the car from an augmented reality perspective um, that I've seen as well. Um, I'd, I'm be careful with 
when and how you use those technologies to make sure they're bringing value uh, and then the gimmick is probably my recommendation. Well, my course on AI, there's a case, I think it's, I, I don't think it is Nike. Uh, a few years ago, Nike launched a, um, an augmented reality to measure the size of your shoes, to measure the size of your feet. And, um, and normally people will kind of say, ah, oh, yeah, because actually that's what we need. But then once you go inside, the, the, the reason why Nike was doing this is extremely relevant. There was about returns, and they found out this insight that a big chunk of the returns was based in people buying the wrong size of shoes. So they launched this as a service and just to reduce the operational costs of returns. That's, this is brilliant, right? And I think they're finding that insight and working through the improvement of customer experience and either going to operational perspective or or even uh, penetration acquisition perspective, that's that's brilliant. Yeah, and so another one in that it isn't um, augmented reality per se, but more so innovative technology is a piece of technology called um, custom innovation. So if you go to custominnovation.co, you can check it out there. Uh, they've got this um, technology that um, scans your body um, and then from your body, it matches you uh, the right size. So it can do a 3D printed model um, of your unique body and deliver you custom made shirts suits, etc. if you purchase them online um, to actual body type like a tailor would do. Um, or in store, you can go through and, and in, um, some stores are starting to um, have them in there. It analyzes your body and it doesn't just kind of give you your waist size, but your whole dimensions to make sure that you, you are getting the right fit because returns are such a, a massive, um, massive cost to businesses. And I think I heard as well that um, wrong sizing and returns is the, the second biggest air pollutant um, for the fashion industry, which um, is a massive thing for them. Oh wow, that's a new. Um, Mark, we running. We're not going to have time for that many questions. We've got to be very careful. I'd like to ask you two uh, uh, final questions. So someone said that, uh, uh, what are the biggest mistakes um, in in e-commerce? The biggest mistakes, I think it's trying to do um, everything at once. Um, I, I'll suggest picking something narrow, getting it to market, see how it goes, then expanding. And that might be just doing one touch point, um, like a website or an app, um, or just one product line, um, or just one geographic region before going too far, um, too much, because you're exposing yourself to too much risk because you're investing a lot more in order to get there. That's probably the biggest one. Um, uh, the second one's probably just doing it because everyone else is doing it and not really thinking through how you can be different. Um, just because you build an e-commerce platform doesn't mean people will come to it or come back to it. Um, so that why people would come to it and design it around that is really important to make sure it's um, effective. You see, class is so interesting, so good that um, it actually helps to remember my students and whoever is watching here that um, all these business and the marketing and even in commerce is just not—it's not just about the technology. The technology is actually very important, but it's not the unique piece. And the students reminding me every class I talk to them about basic things like the four P's and going back to examples about the Iconic and Koala and Uber Eats and how each one took, took one of the four P's, right? It's not just the delivery, it's just not the, the e-commerce, but also product chains and service. And even changing the, the positioning from Uber Eats to uh, food delivery to uh, a helper to decide a, um, a moment of what is for dinner. So, Great, great lesson there, uh, Michael. Um, I have two two more questions. One being, what do you want to ask from the audience and from um, the, the seniors and the students going to be watching this? But before going there, shopping social, and you talked very briefly about Instagram, which is great. So how do you see this? Just if you can talk about another 30 seconds around social shopping and, and live video shopping and all the social elements of shopping e-commerce. How could we wrap up these or where we are, where we're we going? Yes, yeah, so 
It's to date, social platforms have been pretty, um, pretty much for gardens. So you it, you can't extract. You haven't been able to extract the data out of social platforms based on what your customers do because you can't link um, because it's it's their platform, not yours. And more and more so, they're looking to um, have solutions where you perform the whole transaction within their platforms, um, which is great for them because you stay within those platforms. Really risky for brands because you're losing control um, and touch points with your customer on your platforms. You're not getting the data, the learnings from them that allows you to improve those experiences and have deeper connections as well. Uh, and so there are lots of advancements um, or going to be a lot of advancements in social shopping where it will really help from a sales perspective um, because people are able to purchase in platforms that they want to be in. Um, but there is this risk of, of having this new platform, this new middleman between you and the customer and you lo losing connection uh, with them. Um, and so that there's a risk there as well. So um, it's really just going to be looking at what opportunities come out and making sure um, we assess those really well. And I think sort of what's been happening with news platforms on social um, platforms is an interesting correlation because you know, a lot of news was being published within those platforms for charge. They've kind of lost their customers, the ability to charge for that. And now those platforms are going to have, are starting to have to, to pay back to publishers. Um, and so I think there's a big learning there in terms of the impact on that industry that we should think about when it comes to e-commerce and social. All righty. Uh, Michael, I'll be cheeky and I'll squeeze one more question because it, it just came now and I think it's super, super, super relevant. It's around voice and around voice in shopping, uh, considering not just the command and how you interact, but also the value of a brand. Because if you turn, for example, to Alexis and ask, hey, Alexa, buy me chocolate, how the, the, the brand impact comes in here. So we don't have that much time. And I don't want to put in a hot seat, but... Yeah. Voice and e-commerce. Yeah, cool. Oh, such a big topic. So on Alexa, yeah. you can actually do yeah. skills. Um, if you do a skill, which is like an app on Alexa um, for your brand, you can actually give that skill your brand voice. Um, and so you feel like you're interacting um, with the brand and, and something's relevant to you, not just Alexa. Um, so I think that's really interesting to make sure that there, there is that connection there. Um, I think there's there's actual conversion of um, e-commerce within voice still has a long way to go, um, and in terms of people's behaviour, th there were interesting stories coming out um, in terms of you know someone asked Alexa for some batteries and they only recommended 24 pack of Amazon home branded ones. And then it said, oh, got anything others? Any others? And said, no, I've only oh, 12 pack, Amazon branded. But you go on <laughs> to Amazon and there's Duracell, there's Energizer, there's all these other brands. And so from a, a brand perspective, um, another example of you've got to be really careful that these platforms are kind of in a voice environment. They're only returning one or two responses and can quite easily push your brand out of consideration. Where when you have a screen, you can see multiple different products there um, and you're getting in front of people. So the, the how your brand comes across invoice um, and making sure you're in that one, in that first or second kind of recommendation is going to be key to, to winning. But I don't think there's, um, from what I've seen, there, there isn't much volume of purchases happening over voice um, for, to require a lot of investment at the moment. There is a lot of discovery, so that early on in the purchase journey in terms of um, finding the right products. So I'd be sort of um, encouraging people to focus voice in terms of how you can connect with people when they're discovering, researching for your brand, um, more so than the conversion end of e-commerce. But I think I'm going to need to bring you back to talk about voice and talk about all these other topics. But we need to wrap up today. I, I already abused my time with you. So thanks, Michael. Michael is currently Vice President and Managing Director of RGA. And Michael, you have one ask to the audience. Um, what would that be? 
Uh, I, I don't need anything, but um, you know, if, if, if you're wondering what to do with e-commerce and um, you don't know where to start um, or you're wondering sort of you're keen to work out where the best area for you to focus on is, um, please get in touch. Happy to chat. I think I'm always learning from, from other people in the industry as well. So I um, always like to discuss these things. Perfect. Michael, I'm so thankful, very thankful for you. This has been so good. I've learned a lot and I know students, I still have questions I, I could not answer today based on time. So uh, this recording is going to be available for the students uh, for, for some time. And Michael graciously um, gave us uh, the authorization to use this, which, which in this environment, please make sure you use this recording responsibly. And Michael, thank you very, very much, mate. We're going to catch up for coffee when this coronavirus thing is finished. And uh, thank you. I wish you well. I wish you safe. Thank you very much. Sounds good. Thanks for having me.